Welcome everybody to this week's edition of the Extracellular Vesicle Club. This is an event of the International Society for Extracellular Vesicles. My name is Kenneth Whitwer, and in addition to me, you'll also see Clotilde Terry, who is our past president, and also Metka Lana, uh, the chair of science and meetings for ISEP, who often help help with these events. Um, so Clotilde is on the on the line today, um, and she'll jump in as needed, uh, but I'm going to be your host and moderator. Pablo Cespedes is working with Mike Dustin at the University of Oxford, and his overarching interest is in understanding the communication between immune cells. And so Pablo assures me that he's he's not yet considering himself an EV expert, but I'd like to say I don't consider myself an EV expert either. We're all learning every day about these fascinating particles and what they're doing in intracellular communication. So I'm really looking forward to your presentation here, Pablo, on this Nature Communications paper that just came out this year. And I'd like to thank you for joining and invite you to share your screen now. Thank you so much, Ken. First of all, I would like to thank you uh, for uh, accepting uh, the, uh, and giving me the opportunity to share what we are doing in, in Mike's lab. I know the, in the exciting thing is we are trying to develop the study cell cell communication lab in, in the immune synapse and uh, in the immune system in general. So I would like to start this journal club by first thanking uh, all the people involved in this research. Um, th this is the result of uh, almost five years of, uh, of hard work. Uh, we have a team including all of the four major players, I would say Ashwin, uh, David Saliva, uh, Salvador Balvo, and Elke, which really were very important uh, partners in this endeavor. Um, Ashwin, who is the co-first in, in this paper, specifically helped me quite a lot doing the bioinformatic analysis and push uh, the, the first publication of the paper. Uh, with David Saliva, we developed uh, the initial uh, technology, we, what we use here for the characterization of the transgenic vesicles. I will present part of that initial work so, so we can connect easily uh, the previous knowledge we generated in the lab with the new knowledge we are trying to uh, push forward. So the first thing I want to talk about, uh, about today is first the, the overview of this journal club. So the first thing I will talk about is uh, basically the immunological synapse and what's the role of the immune synapse in cell cell communication. Uh, then I will move forward with uh, the conceptual ideas that we want to test and the hypothesis we want to, to assess with, with all methods. Uh, and then uh, introduce results, uh, which first will be structured in a way that we will show the uh, experiments validating the use of uh, bit supported lipid bilayer systems as synthetic antigen presenting cells. Uh, and we'll finalize by demonstrating the use of this BSLT system to study um, biogenesis and the composition of these uh, transgenetic vesicles. Um, and then we will finish with uh, a brief discussion of, of key points that we should consider to move forward or to, or to try to improve the technology even further. So the first thing I want to talk about is, um, let me just, uh, sadly, I don't think, can you see the title screen, um, the, the headings? Yes. Yes. Oh, perfect, okay. So the first thing I want to, to mention is uh, the, the role of immunological synapse. So as you can see in this beautiful video of a light slide sheet microscopy experiment uh, by Erling, uh, by, um, by Chen and uh, and Ces um, sorry and, and Betsik, uh, published back then in Science in, in 2014, you can see that uh, T cells here shown in, in orange uh, and uh, B cells form these very tight contacts that last uh, between minutes and hours, and, and which are quite important for the communication and the uh, escalation of immune responses. Uh, this tight cell-cell contact is what we call an immune synapse. And it's quite important because it enables the, the membrane proximity required for different immune receptors to meet in the interface and signal. Uh, and it's, this is very difficult sometimes to understand, but if we if you imagine an antigen presenting cell, in this case, a dendritic cell, communicated with a T cell, what you will see in the interface is that uh, as the contact process over time, uh, signals, for instance, here is depicted uh, the MHC in yellow and, and the TCR in green, they bind in the interface and they segregate to the center. But that, this is not exclusive to TCR, but also to other molecules, uh, like for instance, C28, uh, 
C80, C86, which can also follow the same pattern and cluster in the interface. And this clustering is which enables signaling as well. And this is what leads to activation of the diesel and, and, and the effective response that we will measure. Uh, so one of the important things that I, I, I wanted to mention you today is, is uh, the history behind uh, the, the study of the immune synapses. So Mike um, uh, was a uh, pioneer, basically, uh, the development of these synthetic uh, lipid bilayer systems, which basically allows you to mimic uh, the membrane of an antigen presenting cell. And with that, you can, by seeding and stimulating the cells on these synthetic membranes, you can image them from the below, and you can see how these uh, molecular interactions take place over time, and how these receptors migrate and uh, accumulate in the center of the cells. So, if I play this video, you will see that uh, in red you have PCR and in green the NSG complex. That as the synapse progresses over time, each one of these are cells. You will see that the T cells accumulate MHC and PCR in the in the center of these the contacts. Now, um, this is quite important because as the cell as the as the cells interact with the bilayers, uh, what you will see is that phosphotyrosine, so signaling events, occur in this migrating PCR uh, uh, clusters. Uh, and this uh, phenomenon is quite essential for the uh, final activation of the, of the PISA. Now, um, before 2014, we didn't really know what was in the center of these synapses. Uh, so Koshik Shudery in 2014 published that uh, by doing this uh, uh, overlay of, of electronic microscopy uh, slices and uh, fluorescent imaging, you could demonstrate that, uh, you could demonstrate quite effectively that uh, in the center of these synapses, what we see as TCR accumulation is actually the release of uh, TCR positive uh, ectosomes. Uh, and Koshi coined that term because these vesicles were derived from the plasma membrane of the diesel. And uh, one of the interesting things is you compare, for instance, and this is one of the validations, you see a T cell interacting with the supported lead by layer. Uh, here shown in, um, in black, uh, you don't see secretion of vesicles. And this only happens when you have an MHC that's uh, agonistic. So this, this means that it's activating the cell and producing this beautiful uh, lateral segregation of PCR. You see that you will, uh, the T cell will secrete, or uh, let's say more properly, shed these vesicles in the interface with the supported lipid bilayer. And in some reconstructions, they show basically in the past uh, that uh, uh, these uh, vesicles in the now here shown in in, in, um, in orange were totally different to those present in the multi multi vesicular bodies uh, uh, as part of intraluminal vesicles. Uh, so now, what we wanted to, to do was to demonstrate the fu functionality of these vesicles. So Koshik uh, did a very simple experiment that was to see the diesels on top of these support lipid bilayers and remove them and put vessels on top. And what he, he could see was that vessels, once seated on these TCR patches, they were fluxing calcium, indicating that these vesicles were actually agonistic entities. Um, so if you if we then we, we kind of start thinking about and the potential implications of these species in a global and more broader context in terms of cell cell communication in the immune system. And if you uh, had the chance to read the papers of Maria Mittelbrunn in 2011, uh, she, she demonstrated that also happening in the synapse is the transfer of C63 uh, vesicles containing uh, microRNAs. Uh, and that was uh, a, a, an effective transfer, meaning that and that microRNA could uh, actually uh, reduce the, the expression of our important gene. Uh, but we have also shown that, uh, and this is important to mention, that Kushik also sh show in some uh, specific experimental context that uh, multivesicular bodies could be also released in the synaptic cleft meaning that uh, the complexity of the transsynaptic vesicles, uh, which is a term we coined just to refer to the to those vesicles released in the interface of immune synapses, uh, could entail uh, different uh, uh, vesicular populations. So we needed to find a way to characterize this in more detail. And more even recently, we have shown that uh, 
uh, and this I invite you to, to read this paper in my archive uh, by Odom Gewalbach, uh, that basically T cells in, 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 in time frames of 10 minutes are capable of, of uh, releasing a significant amount of TC, TCR positive vesicles, which are internalized by anti presenting cells. So we wanted to, to characterize this in more detail, and that this is the reason behind this, this research. Uh, but, but doing this is, is very difficult. And one of uh, characterizing the vesicles requires first breaking that intimacy of the cell cell uh, interface, which is a very strong contact. Um, and the other one is that one, when you, once you study uh, these systems uh, in cell cell context, you see that uh, basically the anti presenting cells quickly internalize uh, the vesicles. So it's very difficult to isolate them to do downstream analysis. The other difficulty is that some of these proteins are also expressed by anti presenting cells endogenously. So it's very difficult to separate what is coming from the T cells uh, to what is actually expressed by the anti presenting cells. Uh, in, in conditions uh, of a steady state uh, homeostasis or actually after being activated by the T-cells. And the other point that is quite important to consider is uh, that uh, anti presenting cells also steal uh, membrane uh, fragments uh, from T-cells when they're uh, establishing cell-cell contacts. So it's very difficult to delineate which components are coming from these and which components are coming from the anti presenting cell pinching off membrane from the T-cell. So what we did was to develop this uh, synthetic anti presenting cell system uh, which is uh, basically based on experimental data. So what we do normally is to study, for instance, a dendritic cell or a B cell, uh, which we, we can find in, in uh, primary uh, cells uh, of human origin. Um, for instance, we, we use tonsillar cells or splenic uh, uh, B cells, and we can quantify this, the density of surface molecules using flow cytometry. And then, by using a silica bit core, we can reconstitute in a similar way as with the glass, synthetic uh, membranes by using uh, synthetic lipids with, which uh, have a specific chemistries that allow the loading of recombinant proteins like item one, which is important for addition or anti cn 3 or uh, MHC peptide complexes, which are important to trigger this activation and other uh, questionatory molecules or, uh, or accessory molecules like uh, CE40. Uh, with David Saliva, we demonstrated that as Koshik saw in, uh, in 2014, T cells uh, interacting with these synthetic anti presenting cells also uh, managed to cluster uh, anti-CE3 or antigen in the center of, of the synapse, uh, mimicking quite well what happened in the Tainer context. Uh, and we also developed uh, two systems. One was based on ET uh, separation of cells and, and, and beads, and the other one is based on uh, call incubation that allow us to separate these beads from T cells and then study what the T cells were uh, leaving behind on the on the beads. So the first thing we observe, and this is uh, related to our work in uh, uh, publishing e life in 2019, is that when you separate the beads uh, from the cells using EDA, you successfully can detect interactions occurring on the interface and leading to the release of vesicles, uh, which are deposited on the beads. And for instance, here, what we did was to titrate the amount of anti cd so a titration, effective titration of the TCR engagement and triggering on the B cells uh, in presence or absence of two different uh, accessory molecules, C40 and icosylene. And uh, what you can see here is that whenever you have C40, um, like here and here, uh, the diesel releases vesicles containing C40 ligand uh, <coughs> or icos, which is the ligand for icosylene, which we also include in different combinations. In the beginning, uh, the, the analysis were mostly based on flow cytometry, so we didn't know if this was actually vesicles or something else. So what we did this uh, then, uh, thanks to the, uh, the, the collaboration with uh, Stefan Valen, which is uh, the third first author uh, of, of, of this uh, paper in 2019, was to demonstrate that actually by mimicking the exactly same composition of um, bilayers of the beads and the planar, if you remove the diesels and then you do a storm on these uh, patches of vesicles, you can see that actually TCR and C40 ligand uh, 
both are present in these uh, uh, memory containing uh, vesicles. We did it also with CAT1, just as a confirmatory uh, experiment, uh, telling us that what we measure in the beads is uh, most likely visibles. However, we didn't have a way to demonstrate that fully uh, because you could uh, maintain that uh, what you see in the beads is exactly what you see in the penis uh, uh, substrate, but that shouldn't be uh, the last experiment to demonstrate that. So what we developed next was the 2.0 version of these bits for the lipid bilayer systems, in which we use actually a histat anti-C3 or MSC peptide complexes uh, loaded in these uh, synthetic vesicles, which allow us to not just analyze what is left behind on the bits, but also release this content by using EDA and then analyze downstream uh, the components or, of, of, of those patches by proteomics, nanoflow cytometry, or uh, RNA sequencing experiments. And that's what uh, this paper is, is, is trying to, to explore. So the first thing we did was to reconstitute this uh, DSLBs with uh, a similar approach that we did in 2019. And we tried to follow up the interaction of TSAs with, with the DSLBs. And uh, one of the things we wanted to demonstrate was the spontaneous release of these uh, vesicular patches on the beads without external uh, influence, without pivoting, without doing anything else, and just following, uh, in this case, C40 ligand, which was one of the components of the vesicles we described in 2019. So we could demonstrate that the TSAs were uh, releasing spontaneous these vesicles in response to, to anti c 3 and the presence of C40 in the bilayers. And then we uh, decided to uh, study other components that we should uh, basically see if, if a, a true vesicular release is, is observed. So then we measure uh, C40 and by flow cytometry. And you can see that when you have maximum anti C3 uh, on the beads, but no C40, there is no capture of C40 and vesicles. Uh, when you have a titration of anti C3 and a fixed amount of C40 molecules, you have. Uh, the nice transfer of C40 ligand containing particles to the beads. And in, uh, if you have uh, C40 and max uh, density, but you have no C3, you don't see any C40 ligand transfer, which is telling us that the release of C40 ligand vesicles requires the activation of the B cell. Uh, in figure 1b, we also explore other molecules like TCR, which is the uh, canonical uh, synaptic exosome uh, component of the of the vesicles releases on release on the synapse, and we also measure C2 and C4, which are highly expressed in the T cells, and we expect a nearly good transfer uh, in terms of uh, its relative amounts. Uh, so, so we calculated um, the, the transfer based on total uh, availability on the total repertoire proteins. And we could see that basically uh, the amount of C4 and C2 transfer to the beads was uh, minimal compared to TCR and other vesicle markers. And other thing we demonstrated is that the, <coughs> the lipids, resin lipids that we use to label our beads are not captured by the T cells, meaning that the uh, structural integrity of the bilayer is maintained in our experimental settings. We then um, um, proceed with the elution of these uh, patches of, of uh, proteins on the beads to see whether these uh, signals were effective vesicles. So what we did was to add EDA uh, uh, in 50 millimolar, and we released these uh, histats. And we could demonstrate that if you measure different vesicle markers on the beads, you will see that adding EDA released a significant amount of these vesicles from the beads. Uh, telling us that the illusion was uh, efficient. Uh, one interesting fact, what we observe is that uh, compared to other basic markers, C63 release was not as efficient, uh, and we are trying to explore what's the cause of that. But the important message to take home here is that what we, uh, when we measure and uh, actually visualize these um, vesicles by uh, electron microscopy, we could demonstrate the presence of uh, vesicle like. Uh, structures and also proteins which were needed uh, from the from these uh, beads. We also performed some 
uh, cryo EM experience just to see if we could uh, uh, evaluate the integrity of the protein corona on these uh, vesicles so we could see that we also could see the the lipid bilayer endogenous lipid bilayer of the of the vesicles uh, which were not significantly altered by the evolution process um, we also then um, performed some nanoflow cytometry experiments and western blood uh, experiments to compare uh, the amount of immune receptors present on these transsynaptic vesicles that were eluded from the beads uh, to those present in uh, normal uh, or constitutively released uh, EDs. So uh, this is part of the one on the paper, and we, you can see that uh, uh, by, when comparing EDs with the eluded of these uh, uh, bead supported lipid virus systems, we could see the release of TCR positive C81 positive uh, vesicles and other C81 positive vesicles, which were much more abundant than in the case of EBs. One of the things I didn't mention before is that these uh, experiments are normalized to the total input of cells or source of cells. So uh, these, these, these uh, vesicle preparations are coming from exactly the same number of cells. Now, when you uh, measure <coughs> the expression of uh, TCR alpha beta in these CDA81 positive events, you can also see a higher uh, expression of TCR on these vesicles, which is telling us that these <coughs> EVs have a higher content of um, uh, immune receptors. We did a similar approach with the C40 ligand, but different to, to TCR and C81, C40 ligand is uh, very efficiently blocked by the C40 we, we use to reconstitute the beads. So the best way to measure this is by Western blocking. Uh, so we compare EDs uh, again with uh, C40 uh, containing uh, BSLDs and the eluates from these beads. And you can see that we see uh, much more uh, C40 being released uh, from these uh, beads. And uh, you see some C81 as well and the typical um, uh, EB Marcus, Alex, and PC101. We then normalize um, C40 ligand um, ex expression or, or um, content on these vesicles by normalizing the PC101 and comparing among different these different populations. So we could see uh, significant, uh, in, like higher content of C40 ligand on transgenic vesicles compared to EBs. So then what we wanted to do was to also practice uh, the size of these uh, different vesicles. And we could see that this is NTA uh, profiling, and you can see that basically they do effectively uh, show a different, uh, a different profile in, in size distribution. But since it was a very uh, a kind of coerced uh, uh, measurement, we des decided to move this forward with um, nanoflow cytometry and, and do uh, confirmatory uh, measurements uh, with, the, with the help of Ben. Uh, Alice and, and Dimitri. So what you can see here is if you look at the TCR and uh, uh, size scatter parameters, what we did was to beam um, the, the events on the flow cytometry um, plot based on the, on the distribution of the standard bits uh, with 68, 91, 113, 155 nanometers. And we use the same binding to basically quantify in, in percent, the amount of vesicles. And what we could see is it basically that uh, the transsynaptic vesicles are usually in the higher size range compared to, to constituting the release EVs, uh, which was telling us that not only uh, these transsynaptic vesicles had a greater and new receptor content, but also they were bigger. And this here is a, a more detailed characterization of other vesicles, and you can see that. Uh, TCR vesicles, or transient vesicles have a, a significantly higher size, uh, a bigger size than, than EBs, uh, also possible for TCR, and a similar behavior we could see for C40 ligand and a C81. Uh, so th this observation was quite important because one of the differences we think uh, explains these uh, size uh, differences is the fact that these cells, when they form synapses and release, these transsynaptic vesicles, especially ectosomes, uh, these, these ectosomes derive from the formation or the preformation of uh, signaling microclusters in cell uh, bilayer interface or cell cell interface. Uh, 
And these uh, clusters have a, a defined size of around 80 nanometers. So we think that that is what is influencing uh, the, the size of the transmitted visibles and the, and the content of the immunoreceptors. Uh, and then we measure uh, TCR expression in these different visitals. So you can see that also these visitals have a higher content of TCR as we expected. So then what we did was to uh, take into consideration that these cells have di uh, different uh, immune receptor content and different sizes, that most likely this could be explained by the fact that these cells, when they form synapses, they recruit different machineries in the interface. Uh, which might be different to the multivesicular bodies uh, containing like uh, exosomes, for instance, or other uh, compartments of the cell that could be the source of uh, different constituent disease. So what we did was to uh, quickly check on the distribution of these uh, visible markers in synapses, uh, uh, imaged by curve microscopy. And what we could see is that basically the colocalization uh, index um, of these um, different markers was uh, not 100%, meaning that they are not occupying specifically the same uh, uh, spatial uh, dimension in the, in the interface. So you can see, for instance, here that you have C40 ligand and, and, and C63, and you can see that part of the signals are colocalized, but not fully. The same with C81 and BST2 and Alan 10. We use Alan 10 because we knew that Alan 10 was not. Uh, specifically re uh, recruited at the synapse. And one of the things that also call our attention is that this is not only in the X, Y uh, dimension, but also in the Z direction. If you look at this plot, for instance, here, you see that C63 uh, occupies a different uh, set dimension than C40 ligand, uh, which could tell us that different uh, subcellular compartments are being um, uh, called upon the, the, the pole of the cell. And, and releasing all of their content. So we wanted to um, corroborate this by using a panel of inhibitors. So we could see how different, uh, the blockage of different pathways was affecting the, the composition uh, of these uh, transsynaptic particles. So we use uh, different inhibitors like uh, dynamic inhibitors, uh, uh, patriarch kinase inhibitors, um, uh, Golgi uh, transport inhibitors, um, Microtubule inhibitors, um, inhibitors of the phagolysosome function, and inhibitors of neutral sphingomyelinases, or for instance, inhibitors of, of the proteasome. So you reduce the availability of, of mono weakening, which is required for the weakening of receptors and the release of these uh, vesicles. Uh, also, we, we uh, use inhibitors of uh, acting dynamics just to see if this was affecting. Um, the release of the of, of the visibles. and we would we could see is that for instance we take the the canonical uh, TCR exosome marker, uh, we saw a significant decrease on on uh, TCR release when we were uh, analyzing, for instance, MG one three two, which is an uh, depletes monoweakening and then affects the function of the SCORT system in, in trigger for in, in TCR. We can see reductions, significant reductions on, 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 uh, on TCR release in these cases. Also with the inhibition of actin, but you know that actin is not only required for uh, the movement of these microclusters, but also for the mobilization and, and trafficking of intracellular uh, vesicular comp uh, compartments. Uh, so we also look at different other, uh, basically, um, other basic markets, and you can see that uh, the, the inhibition pattern is fully different, in telling us that the origin of these different um, basic markers is, is, is actually different. So for instance, one of the things that call our attention is that C40 ligand is significantly affected by refelding as well, telling us that C40 ligand is probably coming from the quick mobilization of uh, C40 ligand from the Golgi or cisterna to the plasma membrane, and then from the plasma membrane to these uh, exosomes. We also saw, uh, like for instance, BST2 and C63 are somewhat affected by, by uh, refelding uh, in the case of C63 specifically, but not significantly. So all of this is telling us that most likely uh, the heterogeneity of vesicles in the uh, immune synapses is coming from the contribution of different subcellular compartments being uh, uh, 
um, putting their outputs in the uh, synaptic cluster. So one of the things we wanted to then study was whether this was an, uh, a shared property of immune synapses. So we used the flow cytometry uh, protocol uh, I mentioned you briefly before to measure the amount of, uh, uh, of the different vesicle markers deposit of bits by T-Rex, the helper cells, and cytotoxic killing for sites. Uh, and we generated this uh, very abundant uh, data. Uh, my idea is not to go through every single one of these plots, but what you can see here is that, for instance, in the case of TCR, you have different uh, responses of uh, cytotoxic T cells versus helper cells and T-Rex. Uh, so cytotoxic T cells shown here in violet, for instance, show a higher sensitivity to, for the risk of uh, the TCR. And we know uh, by studying the literature that CA pieces uh, normally have a higher sensitivity for antigen of T4 T cells. So this high sensitivity could be uh, the reason why cytotoxic T cells release more uh, anti-CR than helper cells. Other interesting features, for instance, is the risk of a C39 and C73 by T-Rex cells compared to helper cells, uh, because these markers are actually enzymes important in the and the regulation of ATP. Uh, and uh, they are have a, a significant suppressor mechanism uh, in, in, in cancer in other uh, settings. Uh, another important marker is C4T ligand. And you see that when you look at the normalized transfer, which basically means the amount of signal on the beads compared to the total signal detected in beads plus cells, uh, it's not changing significantly, but then, uh, as I will show you later, when we do absolute quantifications, this is a significant and very important difference between subsets. All the rest of markers like uh, C45, C63, C81, and DST2 show a similar pattern of, of behavior among uh, different T cells, telling us that this is a concern mechanism of uh, communication. Uh, one important thing I, I have to mention is that we use C45, C and the core receptors and C2 as, as um, markers that are not enriched in the SLDs. Uh, and you can use these to, uh, in your, to separate properly bits from cells in your uh, flow cytometry plots and then do the analysis. Uh, so one of the things we wanted to do is to compare this behavior that we measure on the bits with what happens in the synapse. So one of the things we did was to run analysis on the uh, plane supported lipid binary system and, and, and measure, for instance, the, the clustering and release of C39 in T-Rex synapses versus T-helper synapses that we could corroborate uh, uh, significant difference between uh, helpers and T-Rex. And the same thing uh, with C73, which we could also demonstrate was uh, enriched higher in T-Rex synapses than T-helper synapses. So the bits were, this is telling us that the bits are a good uh, method to uh, probe for different vesicle markers and analyze different vesicle properties um, among different T cells. Uh, so the next thing we did was on the light of a recent uh, part, uh, paper we published in the lab uh, by Stefan, uh, in which uh, basically we demonstrate that cytotoxic T cells uh, form synapses and they release perforin grand uh, and, um, and other uh, markers on the center of the synapse. Uh, you can see the ring of ICAM one, which is the radiation ring. And when Stefan look at, at, at this uh, structure after removing the cells uh, and did some uh, proteomics, he demonstrated that these structures were fully different to, to normal vesicles. So basically, you couldn't find uh, TCR or C81 or uh, other tetraspanins. And uh, when he did the stunt, he demonstrated actually that these were supramolecular attack particles, so proteinaceous particles that have a shell of thrombospondin, here shown in orange, uh, and then a core uh, made of porphyrin and granzyme. So one of the things I wanted to see was whether uh, or beat support lipid binary system could also be used to track these extracellular particles. And um, as you can see here, uh, we could demonstrate uh, that cytotoxic T cells actually release perforin on the bits, uh, and that this release is much more sensitive to those of T helper cells, as you can see here in the closed cytometry plots. Uh, when you compare 
leads contain eight moleculars per square micron of, of, of the anti CD3 versus those of, uh, that have has the exactly same composition but have been created with C T cells, you can see the, the position of perforating and shift to the right on these bits. Uh, this difference is not so evident when you analyze uh, superficial densities of uh, anti C3 like thousand molecules per square micron and you see both cells equally capable of transferring these uh, perforant on the bits. The next thing we did was to uh, use our uh, absolute quantification protocol, uh, uh, which exploits uh, um, standards of uh, equivalent molecules of solver program or uh, MESPs uh, to calculate the amount of molecules uh, based on corrected fluorescence intensities in the flow cytometer. So what you can do easily is to run this uh, MESF uh, standards, and this will give you a reason uh, of uh, how many uh, fluorochromes uh, produce how much of, of your arbitrary fluorescence units. And you can then do a simple linear regression to start the absolute amounts of uh, fluorochromes on, on your bits. Uh, and if you know the amount of fluorochromes per antibody you're using, you can extract absolute uh, molecules on your bit, so you can start doing some interesting comparisons. So, for instance, here, what we did was to study on the patches of vesicles on the bits, what was the relationship of different molecules. So, if you look at, for instance, TCR, these are the absolute values uh, of TCR molecules, uh, and then these are the rash ratio of um, uh, molecules uh, of C81, 82, BST2, uh, class one, IPOS, and C40 versus those of TCR. And we use this as a kind of a uh, code, uh, like quantitative code, to see how these uh, proportions change uh, when, when the cells transfer vesicles and, and, and these vesicles are deposited on the bits. So if you just look at this uh, ratio of, of, of molecules on the bits, you will see that this is fully different to what you find in the uh, T-cell plasma membrane. And you see an increase on, on uh, tetraspanning slice C81 and C82, uh, no much change on BST2, but you see a, a, a progressive production of class one, and <coughs> which is telling us that during the formation of the synapse, TCR is uh, clustering the center and release on the bits. But at the same time as TCR clusters, it uh, basically expels or, or uh, segregates uh, from the center uh, class one, which is a quite amount of molecule on the uh, We use this uh, absolute quantification system to actually start tracking the amount of C40 ligand uh, as, an F as a mole effect or molecule on the bits. And what we could see uh, in previous experiments is that actually C40 ligand is also uh, deposited in the synaptic cleft that is beautifully delineated by the ICAM-1 ring. Uh, and you can see that C40 ligand uh, that is on this bit is actually uh, retained uh, binding uh, C40. As, as I showed you before, uh, bits recapitulated this and we wanted to quantify uh, absolute, the absolute amount of C40 ligand and use this to start tracking the dynamics that affect the release of these uh, mole effector uh, transynaptic vesicles. So using the same approach to flow cytometry, uh, we first measure the amount of C40 density on different uh, B cells. And for instance, here you have uh, B cells from peripheral blood, uh, uh, freshly isolated uh, B cells activated with C40 ligand or uh, um, follicular B cells uh, defined by 6CR5 expression. Um, and the amount of uh, C40 densities. And what we could define is that the normal physiological density of C40 was ranging between 20 moles per square micron to 500. So we decided to uh, create, re recreate uh, bit support lipid bilayers with the same density so we could demonstrate that um, the amount of C40 ligand uh, release in response to C40 increases uh, as you increase C40. However, C40 affinity for C40 ligand is so high that if you surpass a certain amount of, of C40 molecules on the bits, the C40 start competing with the detection antibody. So that's the reason why in all of our, our experiments, we decided to use then 20 molecules per square micron of C40. So we could uh, track uh, uh, as best as possible the amount of C40 and uh, positive transient vesicles released on, on the bits. <clears throat> 
So this was also telling us that the amount of C40 release on, on, on the beats also depends heavily on the amount of C40 present, as I also showed you before. Um, so we decided to compare C40 ligand release uh, uh, among activated and quiescent cells and, and the final density on the beats. And we, got, we could demonstrate that actually T cell activation is super important for the amount of C40 ligand being released on the synapse uh, as part of synaptic vesicles. Uh, as you can see here, uh, one of the things that happens is that BSLDs gain uh, C40 ligand in densities that could reach up to uh, a thousand times more uh, than those found on this plasma mirror of the T cells. So this might be an important mechanism for T cells to release uh, a high density uh, and, uh, of, of C40 ligand molecules in a single vesicular element, which could by ability trigger a much uh, stronger response mediated by C40 uh, binding. Uh, if you look at quiescent T cells for, uh, in comparison to, to activated T cells, you can see that quiescent T cells, meaning T cells that have been freshly isolated from blood and not pre-activated, these are not really good releasers of uh, C40 and positive vesicles. Uh, in part, this was due to the reduction of TSC101 expression of these cells, as you can see here in the comparison of uh, TSC1 expression by flow cytometry, something we could also corroborate by Western blotting. So this was telling us the activation of T cells was very important in upregulating uh, TSC101 uh, score one comp uh, component, uh, which we know is responsible for uh, vesicular uh, biogenesis. Now, uh, we use the same uh, flow cytometry uh, approach to quantify the absolute uh, molecules of C40 ligand transfer in vesicles from different uh, T cell subsets. As you can see here, is that uh, T helper cells uh, release a significant amount of C40 ligand compared to T regs and CTLs. And if you remember the previous uh, slide in which I show you the relative C40 ligand transfer, um, there was not a significant difference, meaning that the relative transfer cannot be used alone to, to quantify differences in different subsets of pieces in terms of the release of different transsynaptic vesicle markers. Uh, we did the same with uh, different clones of uh, expressing a, a, a TCR that is specific for exactly the same MHC complex, but it displaying a different uh, potency of binding. And you can see that uh, these clones, all of them release uh, C40 ligand uh, transient vesicles. Uh, and the only difference is in the AC50, meaning that, that those clones that have a stronger potency release uh, C40 ligand transient vesicles at a reduced uh, anti C3 or MC beta complex uh, density, meaning that they're more, much more sensitive uh, to respond with C40 ligand vesicles. And when we look at the synapses, we saw that there were no structural differences in the release of, of these vesicles as we expected. Now, um, we used the same bits volatility by layer system to test uh, how different juxtaping signals uh, decorated uh, and loaded on the DSLDs influence the release and the composition of these uh, transsynaptic vesicles. So what we did next was just to who culture these T cells with the beads and then analyze the release of different markers to the, uh, to the different uh, BSLVs we, we reconstituted. And just to, to make the story short, I, I will just mention those that uh, show a certain uh, important behavior. So for instance, here, when you see uh, those pilots containing C58, which is the ligand of C2, uh, you can see an increase, uh, which is not significant, but quite consistent of C2 transfer on these uh, vesicles. A uh, similar thing happens when you add uh, C86, C88 or ICOS ligand on the BSLBs. And you can see that now you have shedding of C28 containing vesicles on the, uh, on the bits. Uh, we also analyze how all of these different signals influence C40 ligand release. And you, what we could see was that uh, PL1, for instance, was reducing the release of C40 ligand vesicles and, and the interface and, and, and all the bits. And other signals like, for instance, Oxford ligand for one ligand, which are other 
uh, DNF receptor uh, superfamily members, uh, they were definitely influencing and reducing the release of C41. So now we are trying to investigate the cause of that molecular mechanism underlying that reduction. Uh, now we could also see that, for instance, GP120, which is the HIV, one of the glycoprotein, most important proteins of HIV1, uh, promoted actually a little bit the release of C40 ligand uh, transient of the crystals uh, when included on this, which was quite interesting. And all of this, what it's telling us is that depending on what signals the anti presenting cell has in the surface, is the resulting composition of the of the transinactive vesicles. So we did experience, for instance, with C4 and GP120. And you can see that uh, uh, basically C4 transfers increased when you add GP120 on the BSLDs on the synthetic anti cells. And this is explained in part because C4 is a binding partner for GP120. And one of the important things here is that when you don't have uh, antigen or anti C3, you could see a still transfer C4. And this has been previously uh, demonstrated or shown by other, other groups in which the addition of GP120 synthetic uh, lipid bilayers promoted a pseudo TCR signaling on these cells, meaning that you had LCK phosphorylation and sub 70 recruitment uh, in the absence of any anti, uh, meaning that GP120 by binding C4. Uh, might have certain degree of a uh, of an alternative signal pattern, uh, which we were investigating now. So, <clears throat> other important things we wanted to to test is uh, which uh, endogenous proteins on the T cells are important to release these calcium and And uh, what we did was to target uh, five different molecules, C four, which because in our experimental context. Since we use anti C3, C4 is not required. C4 is usually required to bind MHC class two uh, during the, the, this uh, interaction between DCR and MHC peptide complex. Uh, but in our system, it's not relevant. So we use it as a, as a control uh, for, for, for the CRISPR Cas9 uh, gene editing experiments. So then we choose also guides, uh, guide RNAs that were targeting C81, ALAN10, BST2, and PSC101. And we measure the effect of removing all of these proteins on the release of C41. And one of the things we could demonstrate is that C81 was an important uh, molecule helping the release of C41 vesicles uh, as BST2. Uh, TSG101 was our positive control because we knew that when you remove TSG101, you, you affect uh, the uh, release of the C40 ligand vesicles. And one of the important things is that this phenotype was not only validated by the use of MG122 inhibitor, which gives this uh, phenocopy these results, but also when you analyze uh, non activated T cells and activated T cells, and you can see the different TSG101 expression and the resulting difference in C40 ligand transfer. One of uh, the, the, the obs interesting observations we have is that when you remove RN10, which is a metalloprotein uh, active in the plasma membrane, we saw an increase on C40 ligand transfer. Uh, and this increase in, in C40 ligand transfer is also accompanied by an increase in the C40 ligand expression on the surface of the cells. Uh, so this was telling us that RN10 was an important molecule regulating the repertoire and availability of C40 ligand on T cells. And it could be an important target for uh, therapies aim of reducing um, or promoting um, uh, diesel activation dependent on diesels. Uh, so when we compare, for instance, DCR, we didn't see uh, much uh, inhibition uh, by when, when using these guides. And neither would we observe a significant effect when we analyze C63 telling us that all of these physicals uh, have a different requirement for, for the different proteins tested. And similar to what we observed with the uh, panel of inhibitors, that every single one of these um, physicals might be uh, using and exploiting different biogenesis mechanisms on the cells. So when we analyze, for instance, C81, of course, we observe a reduction of C81 transfer when we had the C81 guide. Uh, it was correlated with the dam revolution C81 on the cells. And a similar thing with BST2. So when you 
you measure C uh, C317, which is PSD2, on the on the cells, you see a reduction when you use the guide against PSD2. So then we wanted to confirm these results by looking at the synapses of these uh, gen-edited cells, and we could demonstrate that in case of C81, uh, PSD2, and PSC101, the amount of C40 linear release on the synapse was significantly downregulated. And contrary to these uh, three uh, uh, guides, we saw that with the Adam 10 uh, guide RNA, um, we observed an increase, a significant increase on the release of C40 ligand uh, and the clustering on the uh, center of the synapse. Um, so this was demonstrating that these proteins were important for the release of, of these species. So next, what we wanted to do was to do a more a broad characterization of the vesicles using the DSLV technology. And we center our efforts in comparing uh, steadily released EBs. Um, and I have to correct here because it's just shed, but uh, for, for me, shed means coming from the plasma membrane. And, and we are not just focusing our, our analysis on those vesicles derived from the plasma membrane, but actually all of those vesicles that the cell is still released on the supernova. Pablo, Pablo, can yes. I just interrupt for a second? We're, we're yeah. coming towards the end of the hour. Yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could uh, maybe- yeah, speed uh, it up. Yeah. yeah, a bit, and then we, we might have a, a little time for questions. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, no, no worries. Okay, so what we did was to actually compare uh, uh, the profile of uh, proteins and uh, uh, macroRNAs on these vesicles. Where we could see is that uh, transient vesicles compared with EBs uh, in both T helper and cytosine T cells display a different uh, uh, and, uh, uh, enrichment of proteins that you can access through our pride uh, uh, database. Um, so you can just copy this, this uh, QR code and access the, the, the database. And the same happens with uh, microRNAs. We could demonstrate the differences in enrichment of. Uh, Different microRNAs uh, and in transient vesicles versus EBC, both the helper and set T cells. So I will just quickly uh, move forward because I think that uh, you can pretty much look at, at that uh, at those analysis in the paper. But what we found, which was more interesting, was that uh, cytotoxic T cells and T helper cells release transient vesicles containing a higher amount of proteins related with the recitination which relates somehow with, uh, with uh, new receptor signaling and with proteins related with uh, uh, DNA and RNA binding properties. So this actually, uh, so I will just skip these slides. This pointed us to the fact that maybe um, thesis were quite efficient, not just including new receptors that were triggered and that, were, that are important to signal activating, activating signals to anti presenting cells, but also they are including and, and, and transferring RNA uh, alongside these vesicles. So we label the cells with RNA select, which is present upon uh, RNA binding, and uh, body PTR, which basically labels the membrane. And we could see that in the synapse, we had release of RNA and membrane uh, containing uh, vesicles, uh, which we could also uh, evidence by high resolution microscopy. And you can see that as soon as five minutes uh, of interaction, the cell starts recruiting to the synaptic cleft uh, these RNA-positive uh, uh, structures. So then we sorted the beads and uh, profiled the small RNAs. Uh, we saw a significant uh, enrichment of uh, microRNAs in, in the transient vesicles of the T helper and cytotoxic T cells compared to uh, EVs. And when we did, uh, of course, the, the, the PCAs, we could demonstrate that this different composition also translates in a different heterogeneity. And when we measure, and not measure, but when we analyze the pathways we, uh, targeted by these microRNAs, we could see that actually uh, these uh, microRNAs present in these and transgenic vesicles, some of them were shared, like you see in, in gray, but some of them, some of these species were specific to transgenic vesicles, I was uh, showing in violet, or specific to EDs. But the important thing here is that uh, regardless, these different microRNA species actually target uh, very conserved uh, signaling pathways and, and, and uh, processes on the cells. Um, so basically I want to just to discuss final, finalizing by discussing uh, an important uh, observation that we had with this paper is that when we measure the, the rate of uh, PCR positive release in, this, in these cells, on the, on the fraction of EBs uh, that are constitutive, 
we only could measure about 3.75 uh, vesicles per cell over a period of 48 hours, uh, whereas in transsynaptic uh, context, we, we have measured between 40 and 100 vesicles just in 20 minutes of interaction, which is telling us that these immune synapses are similar contact uh, dependent uh, cellular communication events might be much more efficient in releasing a, a, a critical mass of vesicles uh, with different effectors and then sustain transsignaling events. Um, in, in the recipient cell. Uh, so it's worth keeping in mind that we should also look at cell-cell uh, contacts and, and the EVs that, have, that are releasing in, in these uh, synapses. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention is that other leukocytes also release EVs in, 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 in a contact-dependent way, like B-cells and dendritic cells. And for instance, here, I can show you that uh, B-cells uh, are stimulated on C40, ligand containing superotelibic bilayers release actually vesicles containing C40. Um, and that BSLBs also enable the characterization of transsynaptic vesicles in response to other ligands. So for instance, we show the effects of GP120 uh, protein uh, on the release of C4, but we also demonstrate in figure S5 that if you use CAR T cells, you can also see uh, CAR T cell transfers per uh, transsynaptic vesicles, which is quite efficient. As you can see, that almost 50% of the, that CAR is transferred at very low uh, um, antigen densities. The other thing is that you can also use, if you are not interested in this, you can also use the BSLBs as a discovery platform to study molecules or enzyme modulating T cell function. And the last thing I wanted to say is that T cell synapses are not the only synapses in the immune system. We have synapses involving B cells and K cells, and even uh, T cells or other immune cells with infected cells, like HIV infected cells or HDLB or uh, respiratory essential virus infected cells. And that if we could study and model these uh, synapses with the use of support lipid bias, we could start. Uh, discovering uh, EVs of a fully different uh, um, uh, biochemical and biophysical uh, uh, properties. Um, so please reach out if you have uh, any idea or experimental question that we can test with uh, supported lipid bilayers. We're happy to either guide you on the reconstitution of these uh, synthetic antigen presenting cells or uh, directly col collaborate with you to answer your specific scientific questions. So sorry for the delay and thank you very much for, for attending. Well, thank you, Pablo. This is an incredible amount of work. I'm just going to read the comment that Clotilde left in the chat box because she had to leave. She says, uh, sorry, Pablo, I have to leave now, but amazing work. Thank you for the presentation. And I can only reiterate that. Um, it looks like it probably took you at least a few days to finish all of this up. <laughs> <So>. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so um, and and I want to um, I I want to apologize to everyone who's online right now because I said that I would unmute you but I think I'm just going to go ahead and ask some of these questions myself because a few of them have been answered or or partly addressed but uh, Phil Askenes has a has a couple of questions as does uh, Susan Goals um, Susan also had to leave but these are questions that are are really related to what you've just uh, touched on here and at the end um, and that is. That is, how can this system be used or be interpreted in other contexts? Uh, so, for example, in the context of non-immune synapses, or for example, mm. in the central nervous system, um, that's what, what Phil is asking about. And Phil's also, also asking about, you know, what about the RNA? So I know you did some work on the RNAs, but are they transferred? Um, so, so maybe could you, could you just maybe expand on that a little bit um, yeah. about how, how, how this system can be, um, can be applied elsewhere? Yeah, so, so that's... Kind of a quite interesting uh, question because uh, I think uh, some some years ago, some someone working in neuroregular synapses showed how the wind signaling was important using similar bit supported liquid bilayers or bit coded systems. So definitely, you can just tailor your bits to present uh, molecules that the neurons will react to and see if uh, they can uh, promote these, the risk of these physicals. So for instance, one of the things we're trying to do now is to uh, model stromal cells with bits or with tenor support a little bit by And what I will say in general is that depending on your question and depending on the biology of the cells, you could either use bits support the lipid by layers or tenor support the lipid by layers. Um, uh, and, and both will allow you to uh, isolate the physicals after. Uh, so it really depends on your question and on the instruments you have available. 
Indeed, but yeah, I'm, I'm you know, I think Susan has, has also made a comment about what, you know, this could also be used potentially to understand the interaction of lymphocytes with the blood-brain barrier or or also of these uh, yes. with mm -hmm. the with the blood brain barrier. So so lots of um, you know lots of opportunities here. I think for people to use your system. And thanks for um, thanks for referring us also to your uh, journal of visualized experiments paper. So very helpful. Um, and I think that I I want to um, I'll, I'll just conclude with with one question here that comes from comes from something that you said in the paper about the transfer of the lipid dyes. Uh, mm -hmm. So you noted that there wasn't a lot of transfer or internalization. Of the BSLB material into the into the T cells, mm -hmm. um, and you said that that had been that was a little bit different from what had been reported previously for B cell synapses. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, yeah. you know, what what do you think are the differences there in terms of you know the uptake that's happening with T cells with B cells, um, and and do you think that this also applies to um, to to EVs? Oh, definitely. So. Uh, we have another paper coming soon, hopefully, uh, which is based on clathrin uh, by Autumn Tavalbag. So I think that the difference comes into the, uh, or are based on differences in signaling properties of receptors being triggered. So for instance, B cells are, are phagocytic by nature. So I, I have also seen this with planar substrates that the B cells try to eat or need the plasma membrane, but T cells in general, in, uh, at least in our, uh, our context now of the beats and the planar, without any other stimulation, they're just uh, kind of secretory cells. They, they, they don't try to eat the beats. Um, we have a, a different research line in the lab now that is actually trying to explore how this is, could actually meet some, some, some of these molecules, but it's not a concern mechanism. So I would say that everything depends on the phenotype of the cell. Uh, and one of the things we have observed, for instance, that dendritic cells and B cells usually try to eat these bits. Uh, so instead of using a B12 deleted by layer, what you can use instead is a planar. So the cell won't eat, but actually will just release basics. So, so that's why I think these two, uh, uh, methods are quite useful because you can tailor them to your, your cell of interest. Uh, and as far as you have the proteins, you can just reconstitute them quite easily. All right. Well, thank you again, Pablo, for sharing this compendium of work. And we wish you the very best as you as you continue and expand um, on this. So uh, we'll look forward thank you so to much. More, uh, more discoveries from you and the team. Yeah. Uh, so, so, and and thank you also for sharing those QR codes. So, I'll I'll make sure that the QR codes are somewhere in the in the presentation that's uploaded, uh, so that people can look uh, closely at your data or, or or contact you if they like. Uh, so, thank you again, and thank you everybody for joining today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at another edition of the EV Club coming up soon. Take care now and have a great rest of the week. Thank you so much. You too. Bye bye.